my intention here is to wrap up all the big clues we have about one specific thing, the golden ratio. Okay, so we can try to understand all the algebraic, geometric connections and rules that the golden ratio implies. So to understand it really well, and that's that's the whole goal, just to see if we can connect more dots and be more familiar with the golden ratio. First thing, there's many many different definitions that are all correct of the golden ratio. So all of them give you a window into something the golden ratio is doing algebraically, a rule it's stamping into the world. Right? So if there's some system that's dependent on the golden ratio, then that system will have all of these rules that we're about to look into in it. Okay. Our objective, since we have a system with the golden ratio showing up many times in it, our objective is to understand what those properties really mean in a geometric way, in a picture you have in your head. All right, so the first thing is there's many ways to get to the golden ratio, algebraically or geometrically. Let's start with geometrically. So say you have a x-axis or a tabletop, and you have three sticks. They're straight and unit length, right? And so a length of one, whatever your unit is. You take the first stick and you put it perpendicular to your to your tabletop, right? Stand it straight up. Its length is one and it's at 90 degrees. All right. At the center point of this one length stick, so one half up, we're going to attach the next one length stick right there and let it drop. Okay. So it attaches at the center and goes about like this. Now we take the third same length stick and attach it at the center of this one. Hang it over here and let it drop. Hits another point. If we label the three points A, B, and C, then the ratio from A to C, the length from A to C, divided by the length from A to B, equals the golden ratio. Okay, so it's constructible from three unit straight segments put in this arrangement. There's a half arrangement involved and so on. Yeah? Okay, that's one way to construct the golden ratio. You start with a circle. Now divide the circle with the diameter. So I have to go through the center point, but you can pick any diameter you want. And so I'll pick like this. So cut the circle in half. Now choose a side. I'll pick this side and put a square in there and inflate it. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but it stays a square. So all of its sides stay the same as each other until you can't inflate it anymore, until you're trapped by the circle, no matter how you move. That's the biggest square you can put in there. Okay. So here, I'll try to draw the square like that. Now, it doesn't matter which direction you pick, but if I start from this side of the square and label A and B, and extend A and B till it hits the circle and call this point C, then we have the exact same situation again. We have A, or A, C, this is the length from A to C, is what I mean by this, divided by the length from A to B equals the golden ratio. Well, that reminds me kind of uh, kind of slicing up uh, the, co the conics, using, mm -hmm. utilizing the circles and everything mm -hmm. as well, based upon where you uh, did the cut. Okay. Another place you can find the golden ratio is in a... Oh, I'm going to need to make that. Get good at that. One, two, three, four, five. Close enough. <laughs> okay, so pretend this was a, drawn with all sides equal. Okay, we have a pentagon. We're going to label the sides of the pentagon a length of one. We make that our unit. Now, there's only one other, if you only care about the vertices and stuff of like this, there's one natural unit of length in this shape. It's what we call the diagonal. It shows up here, or here, or here, right? Or here. So it has a bunch of diagonals. All the diagonals have a unit, have a length of the golden ratio. Okay, pick any diagonal. If as long as the sides have a unit side of at length of one, then the diagonals are a length of the golden ratio. So it's built into that form, that geometric form. Hopefully, this is why. That's the question that should be coming up. Why is that there? Right? You got to be get motivated to so, investigate. <laughs> okay, so and then it, also, it comes out of the circle. It comes out of a pentagon. It 
it comes out of most famously, I think, the rectangle, which a lot of people tangle the Nautilus from it. Golden rectangle. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, but is that the? Does it do it? Does it come out of the six-sided or a seven-sided figure? Well, it also comes out. Uh, that's the pentagon, but it's also in the icosahedron and the dodecahedron. Eight. Both of them have the golden ratio in there. In fact, quite a bit. Let's do one. So, in the we saw in a, a lecture we watched from uh, Wildberger recently, he pointed out that there's three golden rectangles in the icosahedron, right? And showed us that you can take ver vertices and connect the vertices to get a golden ratio, uh, a golden rectangle, three different ways. And the golden rectangle is just a rectangle whose sides have proportion one and the golden ratio, right? Scale it up to any one. They're all golden ratio, or golden rectangles. Okay, so uh, here's one I just barely You can also make it by got. a definition of a square that has a square. If you make a square and then the square fits in the other side. Yeah. Fact, yeah, so if you have a golden rectangle, I think that's what you're saying, is you have a golden rectangle, you can look at it and say, all right, it's a rectangle, but you can decompose this rectangle into a square. So you literally, okay, we have a square in here, and if you get the right size, well, if you get it so it's this length is equal to that length, you make a square, cut that out, then what you have left is another golden rectangle. Yeah. And then you can do that again, choose which side you want to cut off, but cut off exactly a square. And the left leftover is another smaller golden rectangle. You go all the way down. So yeah. my my interest in that was like we were looking um, into the, like the quintic, which only has the information about the the factor of the fourth power. It always, mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. uh, but no quick solution. So that would if there was something to that, that also would, could correspond to why you could find it in the uh, Pentagon, but. So that the higher, good. Um, so you're, the you're, higher you're, forms. you're picking up. I'm, I'm noticing you're picking up that there's also some inherent connection between the golden ratio and the number five. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Five. And but I was also interested if it comes and one hexagon. <laughs> is it hexagon impossible to make a golden ratio out of geometrically? Of any of its parts? Don't know. It's a good question. Here's this one. If you look at the dodecahedron, it has 20 vertices to make the dodecahedron. Okay, and the coordinates of the dodecahedron, if you center it at zero, ends up being this. Plus or minus one, plus or minus one, plus or minus one for x, y, and z. Zero, plus or minus the golden ratio, plus or minus one over the golden ratio. And plus or minus one over the golden ratio, zero, plus or minus the golden ratio. Plus or minus golden ratio, comma, plus or minus one over the golden ratio, and zero. It only involves the golden ratio zero and one, okay, for all of its vertices. <clears throat> so a lot of the geometric forms that you would think of as the simplest forms of certain degrees have some direct connection to the golden ratio. All right. Now I want to go in the land that's a little difficult for people usually because it's it requires more abstraction to to go into the algebraic properties that the golden ratio possesses. Okay, and and what I want you to do is don't feel like you need to understand every equation perfectly. What you're trying to look at is each character is a character playing some sort of role. And when we write down a, an algebraic equation, we're just describing the whole roles in the play, everybody's character. That's all. <laughs> So if you don't know what a symbol is, you can still see what the relationship that that symbol has with the other symbols, right? So that's the level that you sometimes have to first let yourself investigate. Okay. Let's look at some of the uh, features of the gamma function, which is the analytically continued version of the what? The factorial function, right? So the gamma function is a central function in mathematics, can be set equal to itself under an inverse unitary argument, so x minus 1. So we're just taking the same gamma function each time, and as the argument, we're reversing them about 1, okay? And then ask, 
what's the solution to this? Is there a solution, first of all? But if there is, then what's the solution? And it turns out that there's two solutions. Uh, X equals the golden ratio and negative one over the golden ratio. Huh. All right. From this, you can take away that there's a unitary symmetric balance built into the gamma function that's based on the golden ratio. So all the properties we're unveiling about the golden ratio are going to be somehow properties of the gamma function. <laughs> okay? It makes it even more interesting. Get him, get him. Okay, here's another cool thing to add on top of this, though. If we change this in one other way, like say we want to just match instead of the gamma function with the gamma function under unitary inversion, how about we want to match the gamma function with the opposite of the gamma function under unitary inversion? So now we just change it a little bit to gamma function of x plus 1 equals minus the gamma function of x minus 1. Now, I haven't seen this anywhere else listed or, or talked about. I'm sure someone else has got to have noticed this, but the symmetry is too beautiful to not mention. The solutions to this version of putting the gamma function equal to itself, but inversely, turn out to be... Do you remember, Kitten? <sighs> yeah, you're dust in the house. Huh? X equals the imaginary golden ratio and 1 over the imaginary golden ratio. Huh. The imaginary golden ratio and the golden ratio are intrinsically connected via the gamma function. Okay. What is the imaginary golden ratio again? The imaginary golden ratio equals negative 1 to the 1 third. Or pictorially, you can think we're on a unit circle. We're at 1 here. And we're rotating, but we're not all rotating all the way up to one quarter. We're going to one third, right? So we're going somewhere about right here. So rotating on the unit circle one third of the way to inverse, one sixth of the way all the way around. That's what the golden or the imaginary golden ratio is. So there's a con which, if you remember from before, just the, for those that are watching, paying attention, this is the argument that the hyperbolic figure eight not is balanced on, right? That's its argument. Okay. So it's intrinsically here, built into the gamma function, and in a very similar way has its relationship with the imaginary golden ratio. Great. <clears throat> Next thing to say about it is that the golden ratio has something very central to do with continued fractions and the Euclidean algorithm for what? Finding the greatest common divisor, right? So that's what continued fractions can be used to do. So it has something intrinsically to do with the process of finding, all right, you've got this pile made of these sized things and this pile made of these sized things. How can I make both piles from the largest possible sized thing and end up with the ones that we really had, right? So you're trying to identify the building block that's common to both different substrates, properties, piles, whatever things that you're trying to build. Okay. So the continued fraction is a fraction that starts out with a constant, so a constant zero plus one over constant one plus one over constant two plus one over constant three and so on. Okay. And it's really, difficult to write because the more steps you put in the fatter everything gets it's i mean and typing it it'll take up a whole page really quickly <laughs> so it's cumbersome but the thing is we want to see what it's representing it's really just a process of steps doing the same two operations over and over and over just like imagine if you were taking the golden rectangle and you're doing an operation of cut out a square okay now move to the smaller rectangle that's step two now start over cut out a square move to the smaller rectangle over and over two steps like this is a two-step process doing something that's zooming in okay and it can blow up it can go to infinity it can converge it can do all kinds of things but now that we have this form you might ask what's the simplest representation of this form and that would be you have to put whole numbers for reasons to do with matrices but they have to put whole numbers in here so the simplest one would be one 
plus one over one plus one over one plus one over one plus one over one all the way down. Just put ones in all for in all of these coefficients. Okay? When we do this, we're just capturing the unitary construction of the continued fraction form. That's what we're doing. But it turns out that that is equal to the golden ratio. What do I mean by equal? What does this equal sign mean here? If you start and if you truncate at any plus sign, say I only want to go four steps down and now cut off the rest, you'll be approaching this number. Okay? In fact, there's a, a rate in which you approach this number that's fixed, constant. And that constant also shows up on our pattern here, so it's a cool dimension. This is the velocity <laughs> at which the golden ratio is approached in the continued fraction form. It's a constant. You can tell here that it's the same no matter where you are in this tree. If it goes on infinitely. So say you're looking up, looking down, it's symmetric. <laughs> All right? So this thing, since it's symmetric, it has to have a fixed rate here. And the fixed rate has a name in math called the Paris constant. Now we've got a central connection between the continu continued fraction, that uh, recursive operation, one of the simplest recursive operations you can have, right, being identified by that constant, which is also a geometric constant, right? So hopefully that's making you start to, your imagination trying to put together a story for how you could be doing something recursively, two steps over and over and over, right? And then doing one of those or getting one of those geometric shapes we had before, or any of the, there's many more, many more I didn't list. So now let's look at some of the other weird, amazing, weird meaning it's weird that something could have so many of these beautiful properties. We're talking about the same constant this whole time. <laughs> if you take the golden ratio, look at it for a little while, you notice it has this amazing property that it's equal to one over itself minus one. Look at this and look at that. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> okay, but also if you take the golden ratio and add one to it and then divide it by itself, you end up exactly back at yourself. Balance point. Uh huh. Now, I mean, if you haven't, if you can't see why this is so interesting, what, what pops out here, just notice there aren't any numbers you can say this for. <laughs> Right? That's a really unique property in mathematics to be a thing that has that relationship with plus and minus and divide with yourself. Yeah, it's like Euler's number and natural logarithm. And yeah, yeah, exactly. It's yeah, it's a really th a powerful sure, thing to have something that matches itself. Yeah. Here's another beautiful one: the golden ratio. If we want to think about it in terms of nested radicals, square roots, it's the square root of 1 plus the square root of 1 plus the square root of 1 plus the square root all the way. Okay, now do you remember Fibonacci numbers? All right. The golden ratio is intrinsically related to Fibonacci numbers and their opposites, Lucas numbers. Okay. How, what is a Fibonacci number, first of all? You start off with a counting basis, and basically you have n, and then... You start from 0 one. and 1, yep. and then you one. And one. add them. And so that, and then you do 1, so it would be 2, and then it would be 2 and 1, which would be 3, and then 3 and 2, which would be 5, and we can see iterate the process. Yeah, good. So it's a sequence that defines itself locally as it builds. <laughs> Very useful, but it's a, one of the most trivial ones. It's a sequence that's based on the previous two. If you take the limit as n goes to infinity, so it's a limiting ratio here of x to the n. So this is equal to f of n over f of n minus 1. Does that make sense? So this is the nth Fibonacci number divided by the previous Fibonacci number. But we're going way out, approaching infinity, and seeing what's the limit built into the Fibonacci numbers itself, and it's equal to the golden ratio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and why is that cool? Because these Fibonacci numbers are constructively incredibly interesting, right? In, in several ways. They're 
things that fit into themselves that make themselves up as they go. It's a sequence that has a lot of symmetry, and the symmetry keeps stacking and stacking and stacking. How does it relate to the Lucas numbers? Yes, yes. Let me pull that up. Here's another way of writing this construction is with what, uh, what they call Bonnet's formula. So the Fibonacci number, the nth Fibonacci number is equal to the golden ratio to the power of n. So if you want the 12th Fibonacci number, you get golden ratio to the power of 12 minus negative golden ratio to the power of 12 in that example, oh, negative n, um, over the square root of 5. Negative so, golden ratio to the negative uh -huh, uh huh. We got a positive exponent and a negative exponent, and a positive and a negative golden ratio. Yep. And then if we want to take the same thing with the Lucas numbers, so the nth Lucas number is equal to the golden ratio to the nth power plus minus golden ratio to the minus nth power. We just got rid of the square root of five. That's it. <laughs> and we change this to a plus. In all of the entire Fibonacci sequence. There's only one number that repeats. Oh, yeah. One. And I have often looked at it and thought mm -hmm. it was like, you know, mm -hmm. from a set theory point, you don't need to put that in there. It's just part of the set. You're listing the same element twice. But that's not exactly the case. And so it, um, it, it sort of like begs the question if there's like a, two different ones within Fibonacci numbers. Okay, okay. Like an emergent oh, one? Oh, no, how about negative one? In yeah. fact, when you look at the number wall for the Fibonacci sequence, it only takes two steps to get to zero. And what's the row right above zeros? I mean, infinite zeros, right? The row right above zeros is one, negative one, one, negative one, one, negative one. So good, great insight. There's two ones in the Fibonacci sequence. In fact, you might want to think that these two things are completing each other together. Yeah, so yeah. it's just one of those things where I look past it just thinking a little differently. It's like there's not actually a good explanation other than it just is. It's logically, well, you can logically understand it, but if you were to sum this, this yeah. thing out, it's only one number. It's one how, many, how many different size lengths are there in this pentagon if you assume I drew it ideally? <laughs> well, it should be just lengths, just one. No, I mean, there's a length of the of the side of the ba of the uh, pentagon. There's a length of the this. Oh, okay. There's this length. There's the whole length, right? We're breaking up into different lengths. Watch this. Ideal pentagon, all of them are supposed to be the same sides. This length and this length are in golden ratio proportion. Now, if you add those two together, you get... Here's a different color. You get A and B. I hope you can see why I can just say that. <laughs> okay. And then you have another length. The longer one than that is one of these full sides. I could have picked any other place, but it shows up there. Now, those two are also in golden ratio proportion. <laughs> okay. Another one, a circle. Unit circle, put or any circle, put in an uh, isosceles triangle. Okay, I'll put the point at the top, but it doesn't really matter. You can put it anywhere. So all right, now take the center points of two of the sides of the isosceles triangle. So I'll take this point and this point. And now connect them to reach out and touch the circle, extend one of their sides. So I'll go from left to right. You could have gone the other way. Extend it until it hits the circle. And we end up in the same situation, A, B, C, as before. So the length A, C divided by A, B equals the golden ratio. <laughs> it does a lot to the golden ratio. Now here's, here's going to be something that blows your mind. It goes a whole different direction. It blows my mind still. Let's start a little simple. Let's say I want to split things up under hyperbolic rotations. Okay. And we want to do, do this in a very generic way at first. We're just going to do it in even or odd steps. <laughs> All right. So what I mean by that, we want E to an even number 
times pi i plus e to a minus even number times pi i. And I want to know, what does it equal? Now, first of all, does it depend on what even number you put in there? I don't know. Okay, well, put this in Wolfram Alpha and get it set up. You might want to put parentheses like this for it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's two. Oh, it's the even number. Hold on. Wait, let me try other even numbers. Oh, it's still two. Uh, it's it's two. Put in a big even number. Put in different big even numbers. Oh, any. Okay, hold on. All right. <laughs> So, why? OK, why? What's the picture here? What is e to the pi i? It's the base of natural logarithms. Well, e to the pi i equals negative 1, right? e to the pi i equals negative 1. So e to the pi i means we started here in the circle, and we rotated all the way around to this point. Mm -hmm. So we've basically, about the 0, reflected. Right? At least our end position is reflected from our start position. All right, so what, that's a one step of e to the pi i. Mm -hmm. Two steps brings you back here, back to one. So this turns into one. This whole number here turns into a one as long as one, two, three, four, five, long six, seven, eight. eight. Yeah. Same thing here. If we start here and we go a negative pi i direction, so negative one, would be this way. Negative 2, our first even number, brings us right back to 1 again. So this whole thing is also 1. So 1 plus 1 is always equal to 2. So it doesn't matter which number you put in here as long as it's even. Or here, and they don't have to be the same. That's really beautiful, right? It's a very symmetric system. You can be under many different numbers as long as they're even to follow the same rules. Now check this out. What happens if they're both odd? To the odd pi i plus e to the negative odd pi i. Negative 2. Okay, now what if one of them's odd and one of them's even? We got two cases there, so I'll write them both. Yeah. e yeah. to the Odd, oops, e to the odd pi i plus e to the minus even pi i equals, she said, zero. zero. Or if I switch it, e to the even minus even. Now, how were you able to answer that question? Because you remember the picture I just erased, right? Why? Because e to the odd number brought you to? It'll twist you one way and then it'll twist you yeah. back. Yeah. Good. Now, so this is this is perhaps, you might thought thought this was the mind blower. This is the introduction to the mind blower. So we have this base structure in hyperbolic division, right? If you take one rotation and the opposite rotation, you put them together, add them together, then you get, turns out, depends on even and odd. If you restrict your conversation to the even and odd options, you get these things. Four possible outputs, two zeros, positive two, negative two. Now, what if, I need more space. We choose to do the same sort of hyperbolic splitting, but because of all this stuff with the golden ratio, we're interested in splits of fifths. So let's do e to the pi, um, e to the, um, if you subtracted, if you just change all those subtractions with the, then the twos would be on the bottom and the zeros would be on the top. Yep. Good call. Okay. E to the pi i um, to the one fifth plus e to the negative pi i to the one fifth. Let's just change what you had over there and parentheses around it, raise it to the one fifth in each case. So it's equal to the golden ratio.
Wait, <laughs> this thing that we were using even odd structure on, what did we do to it? We just said each piece we're taking one fifth of. Each piece, we're just taking one fifth of. And now instead of worrying about even and odd, we just put the first pi i in there. Those are our first one. So that begs the question immediately. Well, first of all, let's pause here like, wait, what? <laughs> Where did this come from, right? What does this have to do with that construction? Now, let's generalize this to get more insights of what's going on here. Let's just add a k in front of the pi so we can go up in numbers of, of steps there. So we'll go e to the k pi i to the one-fifth plus e to the minus k pi i to the one-fifth. And we want to solve for what it's equal to, but we want to run k from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we want to check what happens, see if there's a pattern that tells us anything interesting. So set that up, and then put in 0 for k to start with. So, ha-ha! <laughs> All right, so I'll make a graph or a, a chart here. We're going to do k, and we're going to do answer. You put in zero? Yeah. And you got two? Two. Put in one for both k's. Get the golden ratio. One, we get the golden ratio. Put in two. And it'll give you a decimal number, so you might have to recognize it. Do you recognize it? One over the golden ratio. Grab it and type it, type it in, put one over, and you'll recognize it. <laughs> right. I'm going to fill in the rest. You can verify them. Okay because there's a pattern that ends up repeating. I don't have to do an infinite list for you. I just have to show you one set and then it repeats. So one over the golden ratio, then negative one over the golden ratio. And for four, for it's negative golden ratio. And for five, it's negative two. And six, it's negative golden ratio. Seven, negative one over the golden ratio. 8, 1 over the golden ratio, 9, the golden ratio, 10, back at 2. So we're repeating the pattern there. Um, uh, base, 10. base 10 pattern. <laughs> also... Doubling this fifth construction that we're starting with. Also the same observation of like the repetition of only of one number. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh and the first half, the pattern's almost exactly the same as the second half, yeah. right? We just have negative signs now. We, we change around the order of things. It's a very symmetric pattern, but then the first time it completely repeats, it's like a Mobius pattern, right? One way through, then opposite way through, and then you do it again. <laughs> very beautiful. Okay, here's another weird connection. Ramanujan's first continued fraction constant. Okay, a beautiful one. It's e to the negative 0 pi over 1 plus e to the negative 2 pi over 1 plus e to the negative 4 pi, and so on. Okay, that's his continued fraction constant, or his first continued fraction constant. It turns out that there's a closed form that represents this. This is also equal to, that's just dependent on e, 2 pi over 5, times by the square root of the golden ratio, and the square root of 5 minus the golden ratio. I know it's a kind of complex and a little bit messy, but my point is there's a closed form representation of this continued fraction constant in just the terms of the golden ratio 5 and 2 pi. Okay, you, you might be sensing a story kind of encroaching now. We might be putting some geometry together to explain the gamma function structure, the continued fraction, right? The thing that's dividing things and finding the common divisor between things, <laughs> right? All of this is leading to, hopefully, 
I'm still building a picture in my mind, but it, they're clues by which we build the geometric picture that we're making sense of the world. So, all right. Isn't that cool? Very cool. This pattern, <laughs> it's very, very centrally based on the golden ratio. I actually like it better. Just, you like it better? Yeah, there's a lot more information, more rich information. Repetition. Okay. The one is repetition. But the pattern, the pattern of this one, once you have the continued fraction form in your head, the pattern is pretty easy to state. Yeah. yeah. You know, this no, one would it, take a longer sure, sentence. This is actually really showing what the bulk of the information is doing. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of the golden angle? Yep. So the golden angle is 2 pi over uh, the golden ratio squared. We'll call it G for golden angle. 2 pi over the golden ratio squared. That's also equals to 2 pi 1 minus. So this is considered the conjugate of the golden ratio, 1 over it. Yeah. Um, the cool thing here is, the easy thing to state is that the golden ratio squared is the number of golden angles that fit into a circle. Right? That's, so there's a square relationship to a circle there. That's really interesting. There's another constant called the plastic constant that's got some relationships uh, with the golden ratio. So I'm going to mention it and we'll mention the relationships they share. So the way I wrote it that's going to be the best to relate back to is a nested, uh, nested radicals. So the golden ratio again is equal to square roots completely nested. All right, there's another constant, this plastic constant, that does the exact same construction except for every time dividing inside yourself by one power of one half, now it's going to choose a power of, can you guess? The golden ratio. No. Instead of one half, oh. here's I. Maybe now we're going to do one and third. Oh. So if we do which we note with a little three here. I could have put I could have put twos up here for halves, right? But we'll put in the threes and now one plus cube roots and so on. So this plastic constant and the golden ratio are directly related in form. It's just that one's nested cube roots and the other one's nested square roots. Okay? Now what do they have in common? Well, it's thought that the golden ratio and the plastic constant are the only two numbers that maintain integer values for n and k under this constructive arrangement. So if we put p minus 1, that's equal to p minus 4 to the power of minus 4. There's integer entries in these relationships. Remember how earlier I was noting the relationship of the golden ratio? How that's a, a rare thing <laughs> to have something match up. The thing we're noting that's matching up here is that we have whole number entries and there's a relationship with the number in itself. Right? We're just using keys and whole numbers. Okay, and the golden ratio, likewise, minus one equals the golden ratio to the minus, negative one. It's one over. Another way of writing it, but this is still a whole number. And plus one squared, another whole number. Okay, it turns out, so the, the relationship here is what? Uh, P minus one equals P to the negative N. That's the whole number we're identifying. And the P plus one equals P to the K, another whole number. So we're, as long as the N and K are whole numbers, you can, Try to find any algebraic geometric number that has that built into it. And these are the only two. Now, if we change the constraints in one way, um,
we can take instead the imaginary golden ratio, minus 1, and see that it's equal to the imaginary golden ratio squared. In fact, it's equal to the imaginary golden ratio to plus or minus 6k plus or minus 3. Some whole multiples of 6 over and over and over and over. Okay, so that means that these before were the only relationships that we had, right? And, and they're fixed. They don't also they don't also have another number with a different power too. They just have these. Okay, this arrangement has an infinite set of constructive fixes between these whole numbers. Okay, and the other one is what we're changing. This one is we're taking negative here plus one. And that equals the imaginary golden ratio to the minus one. Or recursively again, plus or minus 6k plus 5. Or plus or minus 6k minus 1. So if we loosen the constraint in the same way that we did with the gamma function, we were making a, a, a balanced argument of, with the gamma function and itself. But then we said, okay, the gamma function and its exact opposite, minus the gamma function. And we're doing the same thing here. We're adding a, another minus sign that we didn't have before, right? And that combination lets us sail off to an infinite set of constructive relationships between this number and whole numbers. Okay. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah, it, I mean, all these things are really interesting, even if, even if it's the first time you've seen them, right? These built-in constructive relationships to a geometric number, right? It tells you there's a lot more going on in, the, in something that's using that geometry than you're perhaps seeing when you first imagine it. There's an interesting continued fraction of the imaginary golden ratio that's worth writing down since yeah. we did mention the relationship between the two here. So the continued fraction, uh, the short form of it, it's actually two times the imaginary golden ratio, which remember it equals negative one to one third. But the continued fraction is just 1 plus 2i, and then all the rest of the entries are 4i. So if you were making the continued fraction, those denominators every time down, you would pick from this list, which is pretty cool. I mean, every time you get a continued fraction, it's easy to state its value. You, know, it's, it's, you could also use that form then to do things, you know, four steps, Four steps, four steps, four steps, and constructively build something. Yeah. Oh, so, all right. That, like, shows a, that's like a, a top spinning, right? So it initially has to start off along a curved vector radius. Okay. Right? Okay. One is motion, two I, right? Now you're starting to have the parts of a circle. Uh-huh. Four I, you're rotating, 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 rotating. But, like, it, it has an initial spin. Good. I, I see. So let's tear it apart. This first piece here, 1 plus 2i, I mean, saying, let's look at it. Yeah, you can think of it as same, right? as 1 and, say, 2i, right? Yeah. 1 and 2, which then has a connective hypotenuse of what length? Who knows? Golden Square root of 5. No. I, right? And remember, I don't know if I wrote this one down. One of the classic ones to write down for the golden ratio is... 1 plus the square root of 5, all over 2. So it's exactly right there it is. But also, but then if you take the sequence, then you know the next thing, 2i, is going to be rotated through. And so it's also the three-dimensional you know, space. Uh, well, you, you can also write that. Spiraling out. Well, you can okay. also write okay. you, you can also the beginning of a, of, a, of a spiral. Sorry, what are you saying? Oh, no, 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 well, that makes perfect sense, uh, building upon what Casey was saying, because one of the alternate uh, forms is 2e raised to the negative i pi divided by 3. Which is what? Which is, ah. which is basically the uh, the two imaginary golden ratios. Oh, two times imaginary golden ratio. Yeah. 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 
There's also one for two over the imaginary golden ratio. It's one minus two i and then minus four i minus four i minus minus four i. We, we have another constant on the board up there that's related to the golden ratio. So let's go ahead and note its relationship. It's called the Fibonacci factorial constant. Okay, and how is it related? It's an infinite product, so it's heavily related. <laughs> it's infinitely related to the golden ratio, exactly this way. It's equal to the infinite product of k equals 1 to infinity of 1 minus negative 1 over the golden ratio squared to the k. So we can put in 1 for the first k here and get an answer, write it down. Put in 2, get an answer, write it down, multiply it to the first one. And we keep multiplying all the answers together. And then we get this Fibonacci factorial constant. Remember before I said that when you have 2 pi divided by this, that gives you the golden angle, right? right? Or we can fit this many, we can fit... Golden ratio squared, golden angles into a circle. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> you see, we're, we're taking circles and, and golden ratio, dividing them up, product form, infinitely over, recursively over and over and over. Right, what a beautiful fractal form that is. It's like looking right down the simplest recursive pattern, or perhaps the simplest. A lot of the old ancient Greeks would be proud. <laughs> the of it, they love this stuff. This is awesome. All right, so that's, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Um, the, that's, I think, mind-blowing. If you followed half of these, these are built in. They're not approximate features. These are, by definition, the features built into the golden ratio, and in some cases, the imaginary golden ratio, right? But the relationships there are really, really fascinating to stare at. The more you do, the more you let into the details of gamma function and continued fractions, right, to the construction of numbers themselves. And that's what we're really after to get a picture of. You can think of it as the minimal arena, right? But the arena is held together with constructive logic. If you understand the constructive logic, you understand how the arena is maintained. So that's one clue is the golden ratio. It's got lots of parts, lots of connections. It's definitely in the game somewhere. It's a good one to pay attention to. So, cool. All right, cool.